Welcome back to Jersey Matters. The Medical Aid in Dying Act that allows someone with a terminal illness to end their life is now making its way through the New Jersey legislature. Here to talk about it is Kim Callanan, Chief Executive Officer of Compassion and Choices, and Lori Wilcox, who is someone who is personally affected and will be personally affected by New Jersey's decision. Thank you so much both for being here. I, I, wanna, I wanna start with a discussion we just had a moment ago. And the discussion was, I've said, here's what I'm gonna say in the beginning, and this is assisted suicide, right? And you said, no, it's not. <laughs> and you said, that's the media. Mm -hmm. Explain that. Sure, so a person who um, chooses this option is already gonna die. What they're simply looking to do is to avoid the very worst, the very last part of the dying process. And when you think about somebody who is suicidal, that is somebody who doesn't have rational thoughts, they're not gonna die, um, and they're ending their life. And um, it's really offensive to a dying person to suggest that this is suicide because they desperately wanna live, they just have a disease that's killing them. Is it offensive to you? Yes, definitely. Why so? As she said, we want to, both my sister and I want to live, but our lives are gonna be shortened by our diseases. I think people are surprised that you said both my sister and I explained that. Yes, my sister, who is also a nurse, is suffering from small cell lung cancer, and she's living with it right now, but the time will come when she will get a final prognosis, and then she will be classified terminally ill and die soon after that. And how about you? And myself, I suffer from lung disease. Rheumatoid arthritis has invaded my lung tissue, filling it with fibers and cysts. So it's, it's dying of like a COPD disease. And people should know that you're a nurse. Yes, we're both retired nurses. And, and that you're, what did your parents go through? My mom died of lung cancer and my di dad died of COPD and we were with them in the final hours of their life. So you watched, you we, know what's ahead. We watched them suffer through panic, air hunger, pain. So if this bill passes, do you immediately apply? Do you, no, do you well you have to have six months or less to live. Your doctor has to say that there are certain safeguards in place. But when that time comes and in the final days of our lives, we would like to have the medication on our bedside. And how close is the bill now to, to passing? It's passed through both committees and it is waiting to be brought forward for a vote in both the Senate and the Assembly. And this is the third time you've been through with this and this is your, you would consider this your best chance? Uh, we would consider it, we have an excellent chance, we believe. Mm -hmm. um, there are unfortunately quite a few terminally ill residents like Lori and Melissa in New Jersey who have been waiting for this op option and looking for the peace of mind. Um, and we believe that the members of the state legislature um, recognize that and that the time has come for them to pass this option. Now, now Lori did a, a wonderful job of explaining some of the bill and what's uh -huh. in some of the bill. If you could, take me through it. So there's somebody that's terminally ill and they've been told six, they have six months to live. Right. What do they do at that point and, and where does it go? Sure, so first of all, the doctor um, makes sure that they're aware of all available options. Um, so they are made aware of hospice and palliative care and all other options. And if the person still um, would like to apply for this option, um, oftentimes they get referred to hospice, so they also have the benefit of being on hospice care. Um, and they ultimately have to make the request twice, um, verbally and once in writing. They have to have a second doctor confirm that they meet the eligibility criteria, so they have to be mentally capable, terminally ill, a prognosis of six months or less to live. Um, they have to have two witnesses certify that they um, are doing this without being coerced, um, and then when they get through the whole process, they can get the prescription medication from their doctor. Um, and then it's optional, so they do not have to take the prescription medication. And many people have it. I've many, seen it in other states. Yes. It's been, they've been approved for it, and then they decide they don't want to do it. Correct. But, and that's important to point out, that it's, it's their choice. No one's doing it to them. Correct. But it's a comfort for them to know the option is available. So if, if, if the moment comes and you don't want to do it, you Correct. don't have to do yeah. it. Nobody, nobody's forcing your hand on, on this. There's some other changes that have to be made though, right, with insurance, doesn't it? I mean, it, it isn't listed, as you mentioned, as, as a suicide because there would be no insurance benefits with that. Correct, so the legislation very specifically says that an insurance company cannot deny, a life insurance company cannot deny somebody life insurance if they choose this option. 
Um, the person also has to be able to self-ingest the medication, and that's a really important safeguard so that it's clear that they are the person that is um, taking the medication. I want to come back and get some of the pushback sure. on your bill in, in a second, but I, I wanted to... You know, you understand the bill. You've been involved with mm -hmm. this for a long time. We've been fighting. But it's very personal to you, much more personal than it is to most people that are involved mm -hmm. with this. Um, and so I just, uh, you, if, if this option wasn't available to you, what would you do? Well, I would be forced to go through the palliative care and hospice, but I've seen how sometimes that fails. I've seen my mom in the nursing home not getting the care that she really needed and where she preferred to be at home. She preferred to be in her own bed and not screaming for nurses to come whenever they may. And that, is that what you're afraid of the most? I'm not afraid of panic, prolonged pain, suffering, and air hunger. It, and, but you're, you made an important point, which I think is important for people to realize. You're not at that position right now. Right you, now, I'm not. It can so change hope, any day. I still, I, I take treatments, and I live my life to the fullest. When I'm walking around, I'm on oxygen. My sister, she could go for a CAT scan every three months, and she could get the bad news that the cancer has returned, and it's the end. So it's a matter of time. And it's a matter of also getting this bill quickly in place so that if either of us need it, it will be available to us to provide us comfort. So you have two fears. You, you have the fear of this progressing, but you also have the fear of the option not being there with this bill passing. My sister told me that every night before she goes to bed, she thinks about how she's going to die in her final days, and it worries her. She brought up an important point about the patient care, and that was part of the pushback you got. Somebody, uh, I, I guess a couple of people, got up there with patients' rights and said, why don't we just care for people better? Why don't we make the end of life easier for people with these diseases rather than giving them the option to, to end their life? So there's no question that we should work to make um, end-of-life care as good as it can possibly be, and, and our organization does advocate for that. And the reality is that there's tremendous palliative care right now, but it's a myth to believe that um, medication can stop all hunger. About 40% of patients experience some type of breakthrough um, pain at the end of life. Um, air hunger, I don't know if you really, I mean, it does, sounds like it's not so bad, oh, I'm just a little bit hungry. Suffocate. It's a person suffocating, gasping for air. There's not enough pain medication in the world that can stop somebody from suffering through something and like that. And the panic in their eyes, that, which I've seen with my mother. Now, and and you, you explain that it's through committee, it goes up for a full vote. Do you have an idea of what's going to happen? Because you, you've had the bill a couple of times and it hasn't, it hasn't worked. Is it, are you pretty confident this time? So I think if our bill goes forward and goes for a vote, that we feel very good that we have the votes that are needed. The votes in the Senate right now, the right? The Senate and the House. Mm -hmm. we've got It'll it. happen simultaneously? Hopefully. I mean, we'll see. That they, can move, they can bring it forward however they want. So they could, they could bring it forward on a day when both of them can vote, or they could bring one forward first and one forward. And there's no problem with the governor signing it? Um, the governor has not yet taken a position, so we'll have to see. Um, but hopefully the governor has heard from enough people. And what we see more and more is that elected officials are having their own end-of-life experiences where they're seeing somebody who's unnecessarily suffering. And so our hope is that he will bring compassion to this and will allow the legislation to go into effect. That's fascinating. So do, do, do you know for a fact that people have changed their vote because they've had loved ones that have had to go through end of life? Oh, absolutely. 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 That's how we've moved for, for, across four states in the last four years. Lawmakers more and more are experiencing awful end of life. They're watching their parents suffer needlessly. They're contemplating their own mortality, and that's, that's why this movement continues to make progress. Do you have a date? Do you, do you know when this could happen? Um, it can, once a month, there's a vote, so it could happen, you know, March, April, May. Depends um, on when they want to put it up. Depends on when they want to put it up. We have a strong advocate in the yeah. Senate president, so mm, sure. he can put it up for a vote, and I'm sure he's only going to do it if he knows he has the votes. So, sure. uh, is, I'm just going to wrap up and uh, with you. And is there anything you want to say at the end to advocate for this? Sure. Even if you don't choose to use this option for yourself. Why deny it for anyone else that really would like the option and the comfort of having it at their bedside? 
Well, I, I certainly hope you get better news, and I, I hope you don't need the bill. But if, if you want it, I hope it's there for you, when, you. It, when it happens. Thank you so much for coming Thank in. You. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so Thank much. You for I appreciate us. it. Good luck. Yeah. Kim Callanan, Chief Executive Officer of Compassion and Choices, and Lori Wilcox, someone who is personally affected along with her sister by New Jersey's decision. Jersey Matters continues right after this. Still to come on Jersey Matters, Easter Seal celebrates its 100th anniversary in New Jersey. We'll tell you what they're up to when Jersey Matters continues.